1 John 5 20 and we know that the son of God is come and had given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true in his son Jesus Christ this is the true God and eternal life so the son of God is come to give us an understanding meaning our understanding is in the light of Christ Jesus came to reveal the father to us Jesus is God manifest Jesus is God trapped in time Jesus is God in matter Jesus is the express revelation of God Colossians 1 15 who is the image of the invisible God the prototokos of every creature Jesus is the image or Jesus gives expression to the invisible God God is invisible we can know him where he is so Jesus is God revealed to man to know God you've got to know Jesus because Jesus is the revelation of God to man he is the image of the invisible God Hebrews calls him the express image of God meaning i can never know god by looking for god i can only know god in christ god is revealed in christ amen now watch this colossians 1 26 even the mystery which had been hid from ages again the mystery is the old testament that's why it is hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints what the ages and generations didn't know about God is now made manifest to his sins. To whom God will make known what the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. The mystery of this glory is among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what the ages didn't know. They didn't know Christ in you, the hope of glory. Next verse. Whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in christ jesus we preach whom we preach him and in preaching him we warn and we teach so we can present every man perfect matured in christ jesus the mystery is christ in you that a day is coming when god will take up residence in a man god in a man christ in you the hope of glory that is the mystery that has been hid from ages which the old testament prophets didn't know they just prophesy but they didn't have clarity of understanding so our message is a person the person of christ meaning the only way to know anything in scripture is to know christ christ the message now please pay attention because i'm going into something peter chapter 1 verse 20 all right knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture the scripture contains types and shadows and the scripture contains promises no prophecy of the scripture meaning the old testament no prophecy of the scripture or the mystery or jesus concealed or the old testament or the torah no prophecy of the scripture so the scripture contains prophecies to be fulfilled everybody in the old testament was prophesying moses prophesied isaiah prophesied ezekiel all of them were prophesying thus saith the lord because the old testament contains scriptures because the old testament is a progression of revelation that takes up a body in the gospels and climaxes in the epistles so the entire bible is the message of one person and that person is christ so in the old testament they didn't see christ but they saw types they saw shadows and they had prophecies and in the prophecies are promises 
Now, these prophecies and promises and all of the shadows took up a body in a person called Christ in the Gospels. But the height and the climax of revelation is not the physical person of Christ, it's the revealed Christ, which climaxes in the epistles. So before then, no man ever saw God. Jesus said that clearly. In John 1 18, no man has seen God at any time. At any time. Since time began, no man ever saw God. Adam never saw God. Elijah never saw God. Elisha never saw God. Even Moses never saw God. No man, 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 man. No man, no man, no man ever saw God at any time. The only begotten Son of God, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him, meaning Jesus is the exclusive custodian of God. And only Jesus reveals God. So before Jesus came, nobody saw God. With the arrival of Jesus, God came to man in human flesh. Man can go to God, so God came to man. Glory to God. God came to man. Save man the stress of, I want to be where you are. You are in your presence. Using at your tables. Surrounded by your glory. In your presence. That's where I always, no, I don't always want to be. That's where I always am. I live in him. Hey, 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 I live in him. So I'm always in his presence. It's not a song, it's not a prayer. The scripture contains prophecy. Okay. Now, so Jesus said, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten of the father, which is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him the monogenua. Now, watch John 14 verse 7. If you have known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. Before now, nobody saw God. But from now, from now, you know God and you have seen God. The mystery kept from ages, from generation, but now is made manifest. Give me that John 14, verse 8. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Jesus answered Philip and said, have I been so long time with you and you have not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And now sayest thou then, show us the Father. I am the Father manifest. Before now, nobody saw God. But from now, you have seen him. The mystery kept from ages. But now, is made manifest to his saints. So whatever Jesus does is what the Father does. Whatever Jesus doesn't do is what the father doesn't do. Meaning everything that Moses and Elijah and all of them prophesied has to be subjected to Jesus' interpretation. When you read the scriptures, you must bring the scriptures to the interpretation of the epistles. When you read the scriptures, you must subject the scriptures to the interpretation of the epistles. Because the scriptures were communicated by men who never saw God. Hence, in their communication, there will be certain things attributed to God that is not God. But from henceforth, you have known and seen him. Meaning from now, with the seen Christ, we can interpret the unseen Christ. Jesus reveals the father. What I see my father do, that I do. So what Jesus didn't do, the father never does. Did Jesus kill anybody? No. So the father doesn't kill. Did Jesus heal everybody? Yes. So the father heals everybody. What Jesus does is a revelation of what the Father does. What the Father does is what Jesus does. I can of myself do nothing. What I see my Father do, that I do. Meaning, I am the Father revealed. And to know the Father, watch my actions. My actions 
are a revelation of the father's actions as your pastor i owe you a responsibility to teach you certain things in scripture that are important for your faith especially subjects that there's no much clarity and a lot of people are beginning to say all kinds of things on it in recent time there's been a lot of hot debate all over the place on whether people should tight people should not tight whether grace people should pay tight or not pay tight and it's like being a big huge subject on tithing and all kinds of debate people are insulting and abusing people for asking them to pay time and for asking them not to pay tight and all that and tight shouldn't really be an issue because the scriptures are not loud on tight and doctrinally we are loud on what the scriptures are loud and we are silent on what the scriptures are silent be loud on what the scriptures are loud on and be silent on what the scriptures are silent on secondly the scriptures will never mean today what it never meant when it was first written god does not change his mind so whatever he intended when he first wrote it, it doesn't matter how much the times have changed, it has not changed the intent for which it was written. So scriptures, therefore, must be interpreted in the light of Christ. The Son of God is come and has given us an understanding, meaning we understand all things through the binoculars of Christ. What Jesus does, we do. What he doesn't do, we don't do why we are in him paul will say imitate me as i imitate christ so this subject of tithing we're going to look at it very doctrinally intelligently and we're going to look at it scripturally amen you have your book carry your book your textbook for this course chapter two before i get into the mystery of the tithe romans 16 25 now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of jesus christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began so the new testament is the revelation of the mystery the old testament is the mystery the new testament is the revelation and the new testament is acts to revelation so the new testament is the revelation of the mystery which is the old testament which is the scriptures the scriptures are revealed in the epistles watch this second peter 120 knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation private interpretation means nobody can just stand up and say the bible say pay tight you must pay then he opened one place and he saw tight. He said, can't you see tight? He said, pay tight. You have to pay. No. That is private. You are trying to privately interpret the scriptures. But the scriptures are not of any private interpretation. Again, the Bible will never mean today what it never meant when it was first written. don't interpret the bible to suit you it's of no private interpretation some say oh i don't like the way pastors are materialistic yes there are pastors that are materialistic materialistic there are and that also is not right because i will deal with that but that also doesn't mean that people because there are pastors so are materialistic should treat every pastor as materialistic they are also genuine men of god who are after the advancement of god's kingdom and are not after their belly did you hear that so no scripture is of any private interpretation somebody say with me no scripture is of any private interpretation that means nobody will say this is the way i think there's no the way i think say the way the the way it looks to me it shouldn't look to you the scriptures you must allow them say what they are saying they must talk to you don't talk to the scriptures because the scriptures are absolute you are not absolute so you are subject 
to the infallible absolute authority of the scriptures knowing this first that no scripture is of any private interpretation next verse for the prophecy somebody say the prophecy what is it called what are the scriptures called they are called the prophecy not a prophecy the scriptures are the prophecy because what the scriptures contain is the prophecy concerning the message who is the message the person who is the person the christ the prophecy the message the christ for the prophecy came not in all time by the will of man nobody prophesied in the scriptures by his will now that's not to say we don't prophesy by our will the gifts of prophecy operate through us by our will you didn't hear that when we operate in the gift of prophecy it is coming out of our will but the scriptures didn't come out of the will of man that is the superiority of scripture over the gift of prophecy so when a man prophesy you subject his prophecy to the scrutiny of the prophecy the prophecy so that the prophecy is the yardstick for judging prophecy i'm teaching here so that is why the bible tells you when prophets prophesy let others judge what yardstick do you use in judging the prophecy of prophets the prophecy the prophecy i'm teaching here the prophecy somebody looks at you and say don't say the lord as you travel now you will have accident take it and put it on top of the prophecy there is no such provision put it in the dustbin i'm teaching here somebody says does says the lord this is your wife carry it put it on the prophecy it does not agree with the prophecy take it and put it in the dustbin there is no such prophecy that shows you your wife he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing that is what the prophecy says so the prophecy is the yardstick for judging prophecy that somebody is prophesying and thunder and lightning is exploding doesn't mean he is absolute there is only one book that is absolute it is the infallible authoritative absolute word of god forever oh god thy word is settled where in heaven that's what makes it absolute it is called the prophecy if i'm teaching say i hear you it is called the prophecy hmm. for the prophecy came not of all time by the will of man but holy men of god spake moved by the holy ghost they spake moved by the holy ghost over 40 of them 40 men across centuries across you know years scattered some doctors some carpenters some lawyers some farmers across centuries sat down and wrote the bible and after they finished writing years after when the material was collated there were other writings that were collated but the ones that were taken out as the canon of scripture we are the ones that had one message any other writing that did not fall in line with the message the message not a message was sidelined what makes the bible scripture is the theme of the bible it is centered around the person of christ such the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life but they are they which testify of me i'm the message of the scriptures so what makes it scripture is that when you look at it the center of that message is christ so the prophecy came not of all time by the will of man but the holy men spake as they were moved by the holy ghost teaching i'm teaching okay so that will mean therefore that if we're going to examine the subject of tithing we are not just going to take tithing because we saw it in the bible we are going to have to explain it 
in the light of Christ. We will have to look at what did Jesus say about tithing. And then we will have to look at the final, the climax of revelation, which is the epistles. How does the epistles address the subject of tithing? This is very important. So that we settle that matter once and for all in this church. And so that you also start teaching people who are confused. You start what? So, chapter 2. Another important subject which must be examined in the light of this study is the subject of tithe and tithing. It is interesting to note that the words tithes, tithing, to tithe are words that were not emphasized in the epistles. They were not emphasized in the epistles. In fact, it was only mentioned once by the writer of Hebrews. And his mention of it was not an instruction. Rather, it was a historical emphasis. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who received the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people, according to the law, that is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them, receive tithes of Abraham, and bless him that had promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he received them, of whom it was witness that he liveth. And as I may so say, live I also, who receive tithes, pay tithes in Abraham. Hebrews 7, 5 to 9. Now, that is the only reference that you will see of tithing in the epistles. This above account rendered by the writer of the book of Hebrews can be found in Genesis 14, 17 to 23. And we shall refer to it shortly. In the above text, the writer of the book of Hebrews was not encouraging to tithe as much as he was not encouraging to offer your son just as Abraham did. You didn't hear that. He was not encouraging to tithe just like he was not also asking you to offer your son like Abraham did. Look at it. Hebrews eleven seventeen. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. So will you now carry your son and kill because Hebrews put that Abraham offered a son? No, you won't do that. So that the book of Hebrews made reference to tithe doesn't mean Hebrews is asking you to pay tithe. They are historical accounts with lessons to learn from. In reality, some have tried to create a doctrine out of the Hebrews. The Hebrews singular mention of tithe. They claim verse 8 means Jesus receives tithe. This is unscriptural and certainly not true. The phrase, he receives them. That phrase there in Hebrews chapter 7. That phrase, he receives them, which is where a lot of people are emphasizing, was italicized. This by implication will mean that it was not in the original text. Rather, it was and was added by the translators. In this case, the King James translators. A contextual reading will plainly show the reader that he was referring to Melchizedek as symbolic. Hebrews 7 3 without father without mother without descent having neither beginning of days nor end of life but made like unto the son of God abided a priest continually so how was titan taught in the New Testament books of the Bible the words tithe or to tithe or titan we are not mentioned at all in the book of Acts not one mention in the Pauline epistles and none in Peter, none in John, none in James and Jude's epistle too. Thus, this pattern of his lack of mention in the New Testament writing is very instructive as all the apostles taught giving but none taught the tithe or tithing. They taught giving but none of them taught the tithe or tithing. Firstly, let us examine what Jesus said about the tithe. Let's begin from Jesus, our model. Jesus spoke about the tithe twice. One was a rebuke, while the other was a parable. Let's look at the rebuke. 
Matthew 23, 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. The word woe is a rebuke. Hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. This ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Here, Jesus expressly refers to the tithe as a matter of the law. Same as mercy, judgment, and faithfulness. Written as faith. So Jesus was not instructing tithe here as tithe preceded his incarnation. They were doing tithe before Jesus came, before he was born. That is, these customs were already in practice before the advent of Christ. So, just like other practices, which includes the Passover, Pentecost, and all the other ceremonial sacrifices, they all preceded him, who was Jesus' audience here, the Pharisees and the scribes. Other mention of tithe by Jesus was in a parable. Luke 18, 11. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. It is notable to see that the speaker in the above quoted text is a Pharisee yet again. Thus, on the two occasions where Jesus mentioned the tithe, he was not commending the tither. In fact, if read in context, verse 13 and 14 of Luke, he spoke about the pride of this Pharisee. So, we have two mentions by Jesus, which is in rebuking and exposing the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Recall also one mention in the epistles, which is historical and not an instruction. Now, a fundamental rule of Bible interpretation is to be silent where the Bible is silent, and to be loud where the Bible is loud. The epistles are the explanation of the Old Testament books of the Bible. Hence, being emphatic on tithe will not be following through with the epistles concerning how giving was taught. This leads us to a very important query. Is the non-payment of tithe robbing God? Is the non-payment of tithe robbing God? If you have understood to this point, shout a living amen. Okay, let me proceed. This ideology has its basis from a text of scripture in the Old Testament books of the Bible. Malachi 3, 6 to 10. I am the Lord that change not, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God, yet you have robbed me? But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now here, we said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Here Malachi speaks about bringing the tithe into the storehouse. Observe from the law of Moses. In Numbers 18, 25 to 32. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thus speak unto the Levites, and say unto them, When you take of the children of Israel the tithes, which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then you shall offer up an heave offering for it for the Lord. Even a tenth part of the tithe. God is telling the Levite, When you collect tithe from the people, remove ten percent from what you have collected from the people, you Levites, when you remove 10%, wave that offering before the Lord. So the people that were to bring the 10% to the Lord were the Levites. The Israelites were to give the 10% to the Levites. Now, Levites were people who did nothing but attend to the tabernacle. So because they didn't have business, they were not employed, and they were not supposed to walk. They were to walk in the temple. Israel was asked to give them tithe, while they were asked to give God tithe. Are we clear? Okay. And this 
your heave offering shall be reckoned unto you as though it were the corn of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the wine press thus you shall also offer and heave offering unto the lord of all your tithes which you receive of the children of israel and you shall give the of the lord's heave offering to aaron the priest out of all your gifts you shall offer every heave offering of the lord of all the best thereof even the hallowed part thereof out of it therefore thou shalt say unto them when you have heaved the best thereof from it then it shall be counted unto the levites as the increase of the threshing floor and as the increase of the wine press and you shall eat it in every place you and your household for it is your reward for your service in the tabernacle of the congregation and you shall bear no sin by reason of it when you have heaved from it the best of it neither shall you pollute the holy things of the children of israel lest you die this is what account we read in leviticus from the above text moses instructed that the levites take a tithe from the children of israel as their inheritance they were instructed to also offer up a tenth part of the tithe unto the lord as their heave offering nehemiah also spoke about the tithe in nehemiah chapter 10 verse 35 to 40. so the golden question is who then was the prophet malachi referring to in malachi 3 who was malachi referring to notice that malachi zachariah and haggai all spoke about the temple they came after nehemiah so everything they said was in the same dispensation this was when they were back from exile nehemiah 13 4 to 13 this account above in nehemiah 13 shows that they were restoring the practice of the levites and the priesthood after returning from exile because at that time the tithe was restricted to the promised land canaan now a basic fact that must be established is who was the book of malachi written to malachi 1 6 a son honoreth his father and a servant his master if then i be a father where is my honor and if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests, that despise my name. And you say, wherein have we despised thy name? In context, the first audience were the priests. This was consistent throughout the book. Chapter 2 of Malachi verse 1. And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. Chapter 3 verse 3 of Malachi. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. That they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So the instructions contained in the book were to the Levites. They are the ones that bring the tithe into the storehouse. In verse 5. He goes on to speak to the whole nation about not taking care of the oppressed, widow, fatherless and the poor. In chapter 3 verse 5 now observe carefully verse 9 to 10 will a man rob God yet you have robbed me but you say we are in have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings you are cursed with a cause for you have robbed me even this whole nation bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me now here with said the Lord of hosts if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it it is evident that the key thing being addressed here was selfishness selfishness the word meat was translated from the word teref in the hebrew lexicon it majorly refers to leaves leaves it is like vegetarian food though it includes other foods thus the tithe was not money but food The word meat refers to food. The word storehouse was translated from the Hebrew word osta, which implies a treasury, a safe place where they keep food. It was also in Deuteronomy 28 12, Deuteronomy 32 34, and 1 Kings 7 51. It is built in such a way that it can preserve food. The word house was translated from the word baith, it means a temple. These words were used literally and referred to physical things. The period the tithes are brought is the same period the priests are present to minister on their behalf. 
and because the Levites are doing nothing they had no food to eat so the Jews will bring food for the priests in the temple everything is physically explained the word rob was translated from the Hebrew word kwaba which means to cheat someone of something that is not to give what belongs to another it was the same word that was used in Proverbs 22 23 as spoil for the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the house of those that spoil them thus to rob means to spoil to circumvent and cheat it means not to give to another what is deserved it is different the word used in describing a thief a thief is one that breaks in to steal or take something but these are two different things in other words the prophet meant that the Levites were not bringing the tithe which was food to the storehouse since they are the ones that bring it to the storehouse so robbing God was in referral to cheating the priest or depriving the priest who served in the temple of what was rightfully theirs this instruction was therefore not to or for the believer so the question that comes to the fore is is it then wrong to tithe please look at me for a minute that's the question to look at now is it wrong to tithe note the word tithe tithe means to give a tenth or ten percent of your income or earnings hence since it is yours then it cannot be wrong since it is yours then it cannot be wrong however the question to ask and answer will be is it mandatory to tithe your income obviously since no such instruction is in the epistles whoever makes or gives such is not doing so from the scriptures notice however that a key lesson one might fail to see is that the tithe was done to honor God the tithe was done to honor God look at me nobody gave Abraham an instruction to pay tithe nobody Abraham went to war when coming back from battle he saw Melchizedek the joy of winning the battle the joy of the victory provoked Abraham willingly to take 10% and give not pay Abraham gave the tithe of all he didn't pay because it was not an obligation am I teaching Abraham and nobody gave him the instruction he generously gave same thing with Jacob Jacob poured oil on the stone in Genesis and said God if you take me and bring me back I will give ten percent not I will pay and nobody instructed Jacob it was Jacob's willingness he willingly did it Genesis 14 18 to 20 and Melchizedek king of Salem brought forth bread and wine and he was a priest of the most high God and he blessed him and said blessed be Abraham of the most high God possessor of heaven and earth and blessed be the most high God which had delivered the enemies into the hand and he paid and what is in your Bible and he gave him he didn't pay what about Jacob Genesis 28 22 and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house and of all that thou shalt give me I will surely pay the tent huh? I will do what? Give the tent unto thee. Genesis 28, 22. He made a vow to tithe if God bless him. The two scenarios show tithe as honor to God from whom all blessings came. Also, it's not worthy that both examples depicted what was done once. All of them did only one time. You will never see Abraham tithing after that one time. And you will never see Jacob giving 10% after that one time. In essence, 
there are lessons from the tithe. Now, Romans 15, 4. Watch this. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, we are written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Things we are written for our learning. We can learn from these examples. In this regard, let us examine the Old Testament, the law on tithing. There are several texts on tithing in the law. However, the following is very instructive. Deuteronomy 14, 28 to 29. At the end of three years, thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase the same year, and shall lay it upon up within thy gates. And the Levites, because he had no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow, which are within thy gates, shall come and shall eat and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thy hands which thou doest. The tithe was meant for the following people. The Levites. Why the Levites? They were priests who were not to have property in the land. Hence, they need to support them. Numbers 18, 20 to 21. Since they were to be at the service of the people, they had to be taken care of. Paul equates New Testament ministers this way. Paul, in the epistles, equate New Testament ministers this way. 1 Corinthians 9, 13 to 14. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar even so had the lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel notice paul never asked believers to give them ministers tithes rather it was to support them materially and no particular percentage was given we are instructed to care for our ministers. That's New Testament. Did you see Old Testament? Did you see New Testament? Members are to care for their ministers. Generously. No percentage given. Second scripture. First Timothy 5.17 Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially they who labor in the word and doctrine for the scripture saith thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treaded out the corn and the laborer is worthy of his reward the phrase double honor means double wages not just a mere handout if a man of god is laboring over you that man of god should be paid double salary double wages you don't muzzle the ox that traded out the corn. The man of God that ministers to you in spiritual things, you owe him the physical responsibility of looking after his welfare. And it was double honor, double wages. Galatians 6.6 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things the phrase good things imply good valuable not just anything not just anything in other words our teachers must be well taken care of again notice that the word tight was not used neither was there a percentage to the giving rather wages reward good things why is this so Paul had taught how to give in his letters. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Every man, according as he proposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. No percentage. From Paul's explanation, you, the believer, are to decide what wages. You are the one to decide good things are and support for your ministers this must not be done grudgingly because ministers ought to be well cared for this refers to support and caring for their needs and not appetites you have to care for ministers needs and not appetites and i will explain to you what i mean by appetites a little later care for the needs of ministers 
Number two, the lessons to get from the tithe. Strangers, widows, fatherless, the poor, and needy among us. In Malachi 3.5. This category also is our responsibility. The epistles teach the same. Romans 15.26. For it had pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. So the church in Macedonia did a contribution and sent it to the poor in Jerusalem. So it is the responsibility of the church to take up an offering and send to believers when they are in need. I don't see any reason why you should give to the poor and put it on newspaper. You are embarrassing them. All these people who say our churches are doing philanthropy, our churches are doing welfare, then they will gather children and film them and snap them and advertise them. You are making caricature of, the, of those people. That defeats the motive for the giving. It defeats the motive. We are not giving for show. We are giving to help. And our help must be done in a coded way. So that the people help can have dignity. You couldn't pay school fees. So I gave you school fees. Then I snap picture with you. And then I put it on Facebook. This brother couldn't pay school fees. I thank God for using me to pay his school fees. Clap for me. You like that kind of thing? How many of you like it? Anybody? No. All these people that in the name of church, they come around, they gather African people who look malnourished. Then they make pictures of them. Using them to raise money. And the money never gets to the poor. It's hypocrisy. Don't use somebody's poverty for your branding. You're not hearing me. Don't use somebody's poverty for your branding. To add value to your brand. People's disadvantage should not be your promotion. That's not Christianity. Look at God. The prodigal son was coming. The father didn't wait for the boy to come. Because if he had come, he would be seen at a disadvantage. He's coming from peaks with poverty. The father ran and met the boy outside town and stopped him. Dressed him there. Clothed him there. Covered his nakedness outside. Nobody saw it. Then came back with the boy. Giving the boy dignity in restoration. That is the way God behaves. And if you are imitating your father, you should behave like that also. That's why the Bible says your left hand should not know what your right hand is doing. The reason is because as your right hand is reaching out, if your left hand knows, it has taken value out of the giving. Except you are giving for show. And if you are giving for show, you have your reward already. So number one, we care for our pastors. Number two, we care for the poor, the widows, the fatherless, the underprivileged. We give to them. We reach out to them in a very honorable and respectful fashion. Now look at another scripture where the church reached out to the poor. First Corinthians chapter 16 verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints... I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. James 1 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God. And the Father is this to visit the fatherless, widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. In the book of Acts, the church took care of widows and the poor. Acts 4 34 to 35. Acts 6 1. The tithe of the Old Testament law was meant for this category of men. That is why people pay tithe. To take care of the Levites, 
to take care of the poor, the widows, and the fatherless. Today, our giving is for pastors, church members who are poor and need support, and it was meant to honor God. Our giving should do the same all the time. Proverbs 3, 9. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of all thine increase. No Christian should find it difficult to honor God with his income. However, it must be clear that there must be no mandatory percentages foisted on anyone as taught in the epistles. It is key to note that Paul gave instructions on how to give. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him that there be no gatherings when I come. 1 Corinthians 16 2. Observe that the word God was italicized, which implies it was inserted by the translators. Thus, the text can be better understood as this. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as he has prospered, that there be no gatherings when I come. In other words, as you prosper, you give. That is, your giving should be proportional to your income. Notice again, Paul did not mention the tithe or a particular percentage. He need not use percentages for men born of the spirit. We don't use percentages for men that are born of the spirit. Somebody say, I am born of the spirit. I live in the spirit. Now say it very loud. I walk in the spirit. Now louder, I give by the spirit. When we give by the spirit, we don't need percentage. No. Abraham said, I've lifted my hands to El Elyon. That I will not take anything from you. Lest any man should say, he made Abraham rich, but God Almighty. Everybody shouting very loud, God is my source. God is my source. Say it very loud. God is my source. Louder. God is my source. Exactly. If any man promise you, don't put your heart on it. You didn't hear me. If any man promise you money, don't put your heart on it so he does not destroy your heart. Let your heart stay on God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great peace have they that love your law. Nothing shall offend them. Put your heart on God. If men promise you, praise the Lord. If they do it, praise the Lord. If they fail, praise the Lord. Don't build your life on gifts from people because all the people can go on strike. But your job can go on strike. God will bless the work of your hands. If your amen is louder, the work of your hands are blessed. Somebody shout, I receive grace for industry. I didn't hear your amen. So what do we do with the tithe? We do not pay tithe. We give. But even in giving, there is no percentage. And then we are gleaning some lessons from the tithe. We have seen the first lesson to support our pastors. Second lesson to support the poor, the widows, and the needy. Say with me, myself, my money, my life is Jesus's. Jesus is my life. All that I have is his. I am not stingy. I am Libra. I am Libra. I am generous. I'm just like my father. He is generous. He is liberal. I am liberal. I am generous. Just like my father. I'm not stingy. I cannot be stingy. I am not stingy. I don't have the nature of stinginess. I have the nature of generosity. Can I hear a powerful amen? Stand up on your feet wherever you are. Turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I engage industry. I make money. I make money like everybody else makes money amen. Amen. amen now say to your neighbor the children of this world are not wiser than me they used to be wiser than the children of light but the children of light have woken up they cannot be wiser than me i didn't hear your amen they can't be wiser than me amen if they make money I make more money. Praise God. Somebody say, well, the reason why I cannot give to pastors is because men of God have cheated me. 
that men of God cheated you doesn't mean there are no correct men of God. Again, some people have been so wounded by certain pastors. When we went to Ghana and taught these things that we're teaching you and began to open their eyes to the fact that there is nothing like the gospel of prosperity. There's only one gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said to me, there's a particular sister I know. A particular sister. A particular prophet gave them prophecy. And she took plenty of money and came and gave to the church in thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they told her that the money will multiply. And she's been wrecked. Big, big people in Ghana who took hundreds of thousands of dollars and gave to church with the hope that God will multiply and give back to them. Wrecked. And they are hoping God dashed. And they are wondering what kind of God is this. They are bitter. And they are finding it difficult to trust any other man of God. Because they have been abused by so-called men of God. Give them false hope. Took time to explain why God does not multiply money. He's not a staff of central bank. There is only one institution in any society giving the sole legal responsibility for the production of money. It is the central bank of that country under the supervision of the governor of the central bank. And God is not the governor of the central bank. Neither is he a staff of the central bank. In fact, if God really multiplies money, if God rains down money, Jesus wouldn't have made friends with Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, and be collecting money from all of them. Jesus, who is God, will have sat down in a room and just, a, money will just be falling, falling, falling. He, Judas, pack, 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 let's go. But Jesus didn't do that. That means God doesn't do that. It was people that were engaged in industry that gave to Jesus. Women who were in business give to Jesus. Men who were in business give to Jesus. Jesus had to depend on people to give him money and material things for the gospel. Meaning that even today, God cannot reach out to people until some businessmen and women make their monies available. I'm teaching here. Please, if you're hearing me, say, I hear you. Turn to your neighbor say, God does not multiply money. Work multiplies money. Business multiplies money. God doesn't multiply. Kele de gogos. Krenda gola de bege. Jejo jujalana. Receive ideas. Receive concepts. Receive connections. Receive relationships. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I decree by the favor of God, your mountain will stand strong. Thank you, Father. Are you blessed this afternoon? Well, give Jesus the greatest shout of celebration. 